Hey, today I'm on the, on the Zoom to Australia with uh, Shane Chaleo. Thank you very much for agreeing to talk to us, uh, Shane. No problem. Um, so you're a professional punter. Uh, you started in 2016. So how many years did you have to lose before you learned how to win? Uh, it, it was about a 20-year apprenticeship of losing, I suppose. Uh, um, Look, no, look, I suppose like realistically uh, always been involved in racing of some description and, and basically the interest in was always just socially after playing football um, and then, you know, go to the pub afterwards and catch the last race at Perth or something like that at Ascot and, and a few, and a few uh, bets with the, you know, with your teammates and that sort of thing before and after football. So there was always an interest in, in racing and, uh, and, and wagering. but. Um, it did that. It did basically just a recreational punter um, for the majority of my adult life uh, and, until about um, a two, uh, probably two. I took it seriously for two years while I was still working full time, um, you know, reading and learning and, and recording bets um, before I went full time. So, you know, realistically, it probably took me two years of recording uh, my bets and, um, re you know, working full time in a job outside of the wagering industry and um, watching races in my spare time and, and that sort of thing at nights uh, and weekends and, uh, and learning more about it before I went full time. So. Okay, so you weren't even working in the industry as such then? No, not at all. Not at all, actually. I was, uh, I was, um, I was in the agricultural machinery business uh, for, for uh, probably 10 years um, prior to going full time um, full-time punter so yeah it was it was more or less a, a hobby an interest you know in horse racing and that horse ra uh, race horse ownership um, and that got me onto the track got me meeting people that sort of thing and and that sort, sort of piqued my interest I suppose and kept seeing these guys at the track and you know a few other prof um, professional punters that were always at the track and it's like there's got to be something in this um, and that's basically what sparked my interest in it really um, I've always been analytical. So, uh, you know, I was in like management um, and I was always, always looking for an angle within the numbers, you know, within the spreadsheets within a profit and loss uh, sheet. And um, I suppose when I got into race, when I was in racehorse ownership and then started going to the trials and then started looking at the horses that I was watching at the, at the trials and that sort of thing. And then I was backing them. I was looking at what price I was taking, what price I was starting, started recording. And then um, the more the more I recorded and the more data I was able to capture from what I was doing, the more I was able to see that you know, there's some opportunities in here. And then I really probably immersed myself um, in learning. Um, and, you know, like I said, like I said earlier, I did that for a good two years before I went full time. Okay, so you took but, the plunge. Uh, certainly no, no background at all in, in the wagering industry. Right, so you took the plunge. You've been doing it now for four years. Um, how many hours a day would you put into uh, getting your bets? Yeah, so things have changed. Actually, I was um, I was thinking about this today, knowing I was knowing I was coming to speak with you. Um, Pre-COVID, a lot of my activity was all around the weekend. So basically, I, I focus on one region uh, in focus on southeast Queensland. So it was Monday was just a pure review day from the weekend, uh, the racing. Tuesday, I'd be attending barrier trials. So um, where I live in southeast Queensland, these barrier trials uh, they are. Um, televised or recorded or anything like that so you've actually got to go to the track you've got to write the brands down write down the who the trainer who the jockey is the you know whether they're wearing heavy shoes or race plates write the gear down and take that so that was a so monday review day tuesday trial day wednesday was um you know the metropolitan fields would come out um and there'd be a fields for say a friday provincial meeting so that was another full day there so basically um and then Thursdays again, getting fields coming out for the Saturday at the provincial meeting. So it was definitely it was it's a full time job, um, and yeah, there would be I suppose without sort of too much exaggeration, before a bet was placed, you'd be doing fifty hours, sixty hours a week um, on reviews and previews for the upcoming meetings. Okay, so people in England would be uh, the United Kingdom, I should say, would be interested in the trials because we don't have that. I mean, the trainers work their horses on their own private gallops so 
tell us briefly how how that works and are the public allowed to go or do you have to sneak in under the fence and um, so some racing jurisdictions in australia have uh like do record the trials and they provide that information um we have official barrier trial so all the information is there at official barrier trial so they publish the fields the times and the results we also have um jump outs so jump outs uh uh, almost non-official if you like, but they're, they're certainly not registered or as in the form guide like you would see some barrier trials here. Um, so jump outs are basically an opportunity for, for horses to get past like their barrier certificate. They have to have a, you know, have a barrier certificate before they race. So trainers use these jump outs, which are more private, not televised, not recorded, not in form guides. Um, so where I live, um, there would be approximately say, 10 to 12 heats every Tuesday morning of somewhere between six and eight horses in every heat. So, you know, roughly about 80 horses every Tuesday would have this private jump out. So the only information that we get is which trainer has a horse in which heat and the distance that the heat is conducted. So we'd have to uh, get there and, and try and be a little bit, um, strategic I suppose where we place ourselves and not try to make it too obvious to the trainers and other participants of what we're there for but it's pretty obvious obviously but you know pretty obvious that the reasons that we're there um, so the first job you have to do is uh, is identify which jockey's riding which trainer's horse um, and then to identify the horse you need to write down the stud brand uh, on one shoulder and on the other shoulder is the you know is the uh, brand of what drop it was and what year it is so you can determine whether it's a two or three year old or four year old or and um, and then you've got to try and get a look at the horse's shoes because some trainers use heavy shoes, um, some trainers use race plates. So that would be, but the best way to describe that would be is whether you're running a hundred meter sprint wearing gum boots or track spikes, basically. Um, so there's a big difference there, you know, in over over 900 meter trial is a big difference. Um, and then. Um, and then you've obviously got the, the race gear as well. You know, some horses will trial with heavy shoes and no race gear at all. And you see them at the races first up um, from that spell or first race, uh, first race start. And the horse would have blinkers and a tongue tie. And then you have to go back through your sheets to see what that horse wore that year in the trial. So all those little things um, that you have to try and find out manually and, and do your homework. Um, like spending eight hour, eight to 10 hours on a trial day would, would be, pretty consistent sort of time frame is what you look at to try and get the result, to get what horse is which, then watch the trial, hand time them. A couple of guys sit up in the grandstand. We do a bit of work together. We sit up in the grandstand and, and we clock the horses and we and we hope that we get the times consistent over, you know, over a period of, of the day. And there's times where the clock doesn't work or that sort of thing that throws you completely out. But um, over the journey, that's, that, that's where the biggest edge has been, I suppose, for me. Um, is just to be able to see those horses, see what they do, and then um, I'm not sure whether what happens uh, over there with you guys, but over here we uh, we have a lot of in Queensland in particular a lot of horses that have their first race start, and the form guides will say first starter unseen, no public trial, market's the best guide. Um, so that's where we have you know some opportunities present themselves um, on the unraced horses as well as those horses that maybe you've had one or two starts and for, for whatever reason, you know, maybe they were young horses and weren't ready or shin sore or something like that, that have had one start, ran last, gone to the paddock, come back and has trialed well, you know, provides opportunities as well. But the trials is a, is a big thing, all the jump outs, we call them up here. Um, certainly a big thing to, um, to have access to, that's for sure. Uh, now, I imagine you guys aren't all that popular with some of the gambling trainers. So do they try and put you away or do they try sort of hindering uh, your uh, hindering your work? Yeah, look, we've seen, um, we've seen, uh, I'm not sure, we call it zinc cream over here, you know, the, the oil-based sort of sunblock, um, wiped over brands, um, so you can't see the brands. We've had certain, certain trainers, you know, tape or bandage legs because... Um, one of the things, one of the ways you sort of try and identify a horse is by their markings, either on, you know, their heads or their, or their legs. But sometimes you'll see, you know, trainers um, trial a horse with a hood on and, um, you know, some bandages. So you can't really tell whether that's, um, whether that cannon's got some white on it or not or whatever else. So a few ducks and drakes go on. It's, uh, 
but there, it, it is a little bit of us versus them mentality trainers versus the punters that those jump outs for sure um, but uh, look we, we just take the position that you know punters fund the industry so we're we've got to get up there and get the info so we can continue to bet on these races <laughs> And you, have you got any uh, any friendly insiders that might mark your card a bit as to who is what and what is on the day? You um, don't have to incriminate yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, any information is valuable information. It all goes into the pot. You try and you try and have your network as and cast as wide a net as possible. Uh, most of the time, the information will come forth after that person has had a bet. So, um, you know, obviously it's a, there's a fair bit of ducks and drakes going on to see everybody wants to get the top price. Um, but uh, very difficult to hide one nowadays, that's for sure. There's a lot more eyes. Everybody, you know, everybody that's, in, that's involved in a stable or something like that will, that has got a horse going well. It's, uh, the information does spread pretty quickly. It's a pretty small community, the racing community. I think 